The primary reason that we got to where we are, um, we talked about the open source and the lack of friction, but the other one has to do with performance. From day one, we have been focused on performance. What is it that we put in the product that will slow us down? What is it that we can take out of the product that will make us faster? All of those questions are debated every single day downstairs. And we have the fastest object store on the planet, okay? So even on HDD, at this point, we're pushing almost 11 gigs on read, and we're pushing nine on write. But more importantly, our encryption is so efficient um, and is so tightly tied to both hardware uh, and a number of other things that we can actually almost match those numbers, right? So we're 9.3 on the reads and we're uh, seven on the writes, uh, fully encrypted. So it allows you to run encrypted all the time. And so this is HDD over 16 nodes um, with 25 giggy networks, right? Here's the 24 node numbers, right? Scaling linearly, right? In terms of how this uh, business builds. So right now, I, we haven't run the uh, encrypted numbers, but we're at 16 and nine, right? So it's a, it's a good scale from a linear perspective. And these are HDD numbers. So the economics on this are extraordinarily good. You can basically run a full analytics workload on HDD um, across massive, massive amounts of data. So that brings us into the machine learning workloads where nobody else has been able to penetrate that from an object storage perspective, but we are today. If you want to take it up a notch and do what the banks are doing today with, uh, with MinIO, you're going to start to look at NVMe. So NVMe, they've adopted, they've determined from an ROI perspective that that makes the most sense for their business at this point. And so you'll see on eight nodes, we're doing 46 gigs on the read and we're doing 34 on the writes. And our encrypted numbers, again, are right there in terms of speed. You say, in fact, you'll uh, see that our, our distributed eight? with encryption is, is actually it's an anomaly, but it's a slightly faster than our non-encrypted number. An eight node NVMe solution has eight SSDs across however many nodes, or, or how? Yeah, so. Uh, What's the configuration? So this particular one, we actually use the i3 bare metal because we also like to compare against Amazon S3. Uh, this is actually eight, server, eight, uh, eight servers, eight drives each. Uh, on Amazon, Amazon's bare metal actually is slower than the real world NVMe we see on-prem at customer site. Uh, per drive, we are seeing 3.3 gigabytes per second reads and around two gigabytes per second uh, writes. On Amazon, we found that uh, it's around one, one X, like one, one point something, but, uh, but even at that performance, when you put eight drives, you are basically choking a 100 gigabit network. So it didn't matter to us. While Amazon environment is lower than the on-prem environment, but uh, uh, but these numbers are still actually very good numbers. Uh, we are able to choke with just eight drives. You are essentially choking a 100 gigabit NIC. Can I add a second 100 gigabit NIC? The problem we run into is the PCIe Gen 3 is a bottleneck. That's your question. No. Okay. <laughs> so I'm trying to understand how many how many compute servers and how many how what's the storage configuration to compute servers? Is it an eight node NVMe is has eight SSDs, but they're one per server? Eight per server. Eight per server. How many servers in this configuration? This is uh, this is actually eight servers, eight eight clients. Uh, we are able to actually choke. We need to have enough clients. So each server has eight SSDs. Correct. 64 NVMe SSDs in this That is correct. And 100 gigabit NIC on each one of them. Understand. Yes. So we have full papers uh, available on MinIO for each one of the scenarios that I'm showing you um, with all of the test benchmark details um, and the, the exact configuration in there. I'm sorry if I wasn't clear on that. I apologize. So you actually can take this all the way to 32 nodes. So this was a lot of fun for the team here. Um, 32 nodes is the largest instance of NVMe that you can get. So it's 32 times 8. Yeah. Um, in this case, is that right? Yeah. You uh, could, you can actually. It's not the largest. It's the largest we can get it on Amazon. We cannot afford to buy these machines, right? It's expensive, uh, and they get obsolete within like another six months or one year. But the, but this is the one largest we can find. So, and you can see here, we're up to 183 gigs a second. So, on, in aggregate, it's 1.48 terabits per second uh, in terms of throughput, and so that is you know, obviously allows you to do anything you want from a workload perspective. Um, and that's, you know, not uncommon hardware at this point. This is, un this is not unobtaining stuff. Um, it is just uh, higher end hardware. And so at that speeds, again, everything comes into play. You can see the linear scalability here. Um, these are the NVMe numbers. These are the HDD numbers here. Um, and we, 
you know, very proud of that because it allows you to project this out um, and go as far as you want to in terms of your deployment size. <coughs> the other component, um, which we talked about earlier in the, in the conversation, is, you know, is HDFS dead? Well, whether it is or whether it's not, uh, that debate <laughs> will let you guys uh, settle that. Um, but we'll tell you right now that we've made it very, very easy for somebody to actually move over to modern cloud, private cloud object storage um, by basically creating a system that is fundamentally faster than what you can do on HDFS. So this is count, uh, 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 sort, and word count, um, and you can look at these, and we are materially faster than HDFS uh, in, that, uh, in that environment. And again, the full paper is available on our website if you want to get into it from a detailed perspective. Is there also any capacity uh, improvement? Uh, I mean. Uh, HDFS with the three copies against uh, uh, racer coding. coding, for example. Yeah, 1.4. Um, it's a huge economic uh, benefit to start to migrate all those workloads over. So, so it's not only the performance, it's just uh, also the, yeah. Yeah. the overall. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, and then keep, keep in mind just the, <coughs> the simplicity of MinIO. You know, one person can run giant, giant uh, instances of MinIO you don't need one for every uh, uh, an administrator for every 10 nodes or whatever it is that you need for, for mm -hmm. a dupe. So you have simplicity, you have you know, far better um, economics from a disaggregation standpoint on um, just the, the replication and or erasure coding comparison, um, and then you have the performance benefit. So yeah, also the remote replication is another issue with, with HDFS, with the objects yeah. or Absolutely. gas you have. Yeah you know, a mechanism, so. And also, the, the, it's, this is a theoretical, it's actually a, a, the, the spec, the standard, H, standard HDFS benchmarks optimize for HDFS environment, right? The real world actually is quite different. We found that it's not three copies, like uh, one, of the, one of the customers that recently migrated off of uh, H, uh, Hadoop HDFS, uh, they actually had, on average, 15 copies of the data. Uh, and uh, then uh, the, uh, the, the real pro the, there are other things when uh, they run into uh, in, uh, with HDFS, you have a node drive limit on, on each node. So essentially, most of your nodes are just compute nodes sitting idle uh, because you, you, your data is growing faster than compute. What they actually find in the real world is they ditch Hadoop and then bring Spark, Presto, TensorFlow type applications where they pull the data through fast network into the memory and they do all the mutations in memory. This actually allows them to replace a giant Hadoop cluster with a much smaller footprint. And all the attendant benefits that come from cooling and, and so forth that go with that. Look, can I uh, imagine a MinIO cluster and on top of it having all the analytics tool instead yes. of, uh, yes. like I, I can have on Hadoop, for example. Spark, Presto, TensorFlow, H2O all run on top of MinIO. There's extensive documentation out there to no, cover those use cases. Not on top in, in the sense in a separate class. In the same yeah, 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 yeah. Disaggregated. So the, the, the data persistence is on MinIO. And the compute nodes are all running pretty much. It's not just Spark, Presto. Even if you see Vertica, Teradata, everything like Splunk, they all have gone uh, disaggregated. Even MariaDB a uh, like couple of weeks before they announced X4, if all the databases are going disaggregated. They, go, they become the compute nodes. And the compute nodes may have some storage too. It's nice to put some NVMe or obtain memory, that's actually your scratch data. They call it as a hot store. Essentially, it's a, it's, a, it's a cache. And we become the persistence layer. And they actually pound on us in terms of throughput. But all the IOPS and mutations happen on the local memory or the local, uh, local scratch space, which is NVMe or obtain memory. OK. Um, there's also the comparison that we have here between MinIO and AWS. And the point here is not that we're faster or they're faster. Uh, in truth, actually, we're a little bit faster in Spark. They're a little bit faster on Presto. Um, but the point here is that Amazon opened up the market by really putting the standard in place that object storage can be fast as well. And so we've used that as a standard by which we've challenged ourselves um, to be as fast as that. Um, they have some specific advantages. of global service is something that's not strictly consistent. But net-net, we think this is a good comparison. And it speaks to the fact that object storage is now the primary storage that you find in the cloud. It's actually doing away um, very often with uh, SAN and NAS implementations because of the speed and because of the flexibility that it offers. 
So in terms of why we're so fast, there's really four things that I want to cover here before I turn it over for AB to really go into the internals of the entire system. So the first is that we're single layer. As AB mentioned at the beginning of this, when we started MinIO, we said we're going to do one thing, and we're going to do one thing very, very well, and that is to serve objects. And we endeavor to be the best in the world at that. The next is we looked at it, and the team that usually sits up here, which we've displaced for this, uh, for this event, really focuses on hardware acceleration. So we're looking at using SIMD acceleration on the AVX 512 instruction set to really allow ourselves to scream from a commodity, stamp, commodity hardware standpoint and to get the most out of the hardware. We also don't employ a metadata database. And that's very important as well, because that is an, not only a source, a single source of failure, single point of failure, but if you're trying to do bulk updates or bulk deletes uh, with a metadata database, and it's a Cassandra database, for example, it's not going to work, right? It's going to either fall over dead or at least really just bring it to its knees. And so by writing everything atomically, we allow ourselves to really skip that step and be much, much faster than anybody else in the space. And then finally, um, we have employed um, both Go and then the Go assembly language to really target things to the task. And the same team that sits up here that works on the SIMD acceleration uh, is also working on that. And it allows us to really scream for these high throughput, but also analytic workloads um, that are really hitting and pushing us uh, in that direction. Does the SIMD stuff work on ARM? Yeah, actually. Okay. So, it, so ARM actually has uh, SIMD extensions too. Uh, okay. They are called NEON instructions. Like uh, uh, Intel has uh, AVX512, uh, AVX512, AVX256, SSE4, SSE2. We keep fall, falling back, right? On ARM, it's NEON instructions. On P Power also, they have uh, these PML instructions. But uh, we uh, we found on some cases, like SHA256 uh, SHA calculation, ARM was significantly faster than uh, uh, Xeon. I'm like, that's not possible, right? Then we later, later we found out that ARM being used in the network controllers, that's one thing they optimized it really well. OK. Yeah. yeah. So when you're that fast, you're looking at a different set of use cases. And again, when I talked about us approaching this problem differently, we always approach this from a different use case perspective. So we're doing big data and machine learning workloads. That's not really been in, in the, in the uh, purvey of object stores in the past, but it is for us. The HDFS replacements, you can't do it unless you're faster than HDFS. No one's going to take a step backwards to get better economics and scale when you're talking about performance. Net new high performance data lakes. Again, we get brought into these for large financial institutions that are rethinking their architectures and they want to start with a cloud native approach, but they want to do it on a private cloud. The cloud native application piece, again, our pivotal tile is one that's been downloaded millions and millions of times. Um, it's one of these things where it just speaks to that cloud-native element of us. The multi-cloud, obviously, you know. We've taught the world how to speak S3. And then finally, the endpoint for streaming workloads. Edge is going to be a massive part of the story from a storage perspective in 2020. And we think that we're very well positioned given how lightweight we are, given all the places that we can run, and given the fact that um, we can handle all of those uh, issues. Specifically, what kind of applications are you thinking there? Uh, on the edge side? Like gaming or what kind of streaming workloads do you think? So um, we have a huge presence in the gaming area. Most of the game developers uh, run large instances of MinIO. Autonomous vehicles is another one. Um, there's a number of companies, both large and small, um, that are using us in that space. Um, and then in the 5G world, um, most of the major telcos uh, in the world, from uh, France uh, all the way through the east coast of the U.S., um, are um, using us in those, in those environments. Initially, we started seeing autonomous driving, but then we also see that now the same thing is getting extended into like warehouse automation, these are robots moving. It's essentially the same use case, but uh, the, they are also in the same category as autonomous. And I think 5G will open up basically a whole new class of application, but today uh, we are seeing that uh, automobile is already there. So the data that exists outside of AWS, you think that's going to be at the edge, or where do you think that's going to? 
are just dispersed everywhere. Yeah, I think it's going to be dispersed everywhere. Uh, what customers are basically saying, in a simpler sense, AWS, the way they look at it is, that's like staying in a hotel, right? You go to a private cloud, uh, when essentially your data grows into even a couple of petabytes, they see that it's expensive, they go to a colo. So essentially what's happening is the large enterprises are seeing themselves as, we are now large enough, we can run this infrastructure better than our, uh, better than outsourcing it. So the the the, the tier two which, uh, cloud actually see these are the large enterprises. The publicly traded companies will take the control back. No one needs to build a data center. That's a commodity, right? For some of this application, there are you know you, you can have deep integrations with the framework. Like uh, for example, for TensorFlow, you can have a storage plugin. For example, yes. Are you planning to do some of this integration because they optimize you know all the back and forth between the, the yeah. framework and and the object store? Or do you plan all you to do S3? Yeah, so that actually turned out to be a huge advantage for us because all of this uh, adoption, if you see, in each one of them, whether TensorFlow itself, for example, if you search TensorFlow S3, it will take you to their documentation page, and you scroll down at the bottom and see they would have documented for S3 endpoint, Google Cloud, actually Amazon S3, Google Cloud, and Minivo. We are the only choice that they documented for private cloud, uh, like Elasticsearch Snapshot. Pretty much all these product documentations our users are finding us from their documentation is something that community did this for us. We couldn't have possibly like put all that effort, but our effort is going towards like the the enterprise applications, working closely with Splunk, working closely with the Teradata, Vertica, those kind of players. But but not to build the specific uh, you know plugins or specific uh, so S3. Sorry, yep. just you standard to, S3. Yeah, yeah, no customization needed. And I think AB brings up a very good point, uh, which I'll close on which is, you know, if you want to understand this for yourself, you pick your favorite company that's in this uh, sort of cloud native space, and you type in their name, MinIO, and S3, or whatever it is, and you're going to find somebody out there from a community standpoint who's done a video, written a blog, um, you know, done a test, contributed code to GitHub. Whatever it is, you'll find it. It is a two-second proof point. Um, of how pervasively and extensively um, we are now built into the ecosystem that is the private cloud uh, across this entire uh, globe uh, at that point.